When you think of earthquakes in the US, you probably think of California. Maybe your mind wanders up north to Alaska, the most seismically active state in the country. Maybe you know all about the Cascadia subduction zone, and your mind goes to the Pacific Northwest. Do you think of Utah when you think of earthquakes? Because a massive fault line runs directly beneath Salt Lake City and other north central Utah communities, directly threatening the lives of over 2.8 million people. This fault line is known as the Wasatch Fault, and is directly responsible for not only uplifting the gorgeous Wasatch Range, but also for generating devastating earthquakes in the region. Seismologists have indicated that there is a 57% chance of a devastating magnitude 6.0 or stronger earthquake to strike the region within the next 50 years, a serious threat to residents of the Wasatch Front. Earthquakes as strong as magnitude 6.8 regularly occur on the fault, and the fault line could produce a tembler as strong as magnitude 7.5, a worst case scenario that would spell disaster for northern Utah. In this episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures, we're going to learn all about the Wasatch Fault as we explore the geology, history, and future of Utah's ticking time bomb. Let's do it. Running for roughly 220 miles from Fayette, Utah through the Wasatch Front up to Mallard City, Idaho, the Wasatch Fault is the easternmost fault line in a geologically active province known as the Basin and Range, which stretches from the Wasatch Range in Utah west to the Sierra Nevada in California. Responsible for uplifting the Wasatch Range, the Wasatch Fault is considered a normal fault, meaning that the block of rock underneath the fault, or foot wall, moves up, while the block of rock above the fault, or hanging wall, moves down. Normal faults are generated by extensional forces, the main driver here being subterranean magma beneath the basin and range that pushes the Earth's crust up and fractures it as it does so, causing crustal extension in the region. As the crust is being torn asunder beneath the basin and range, magma from the mantle of the earth is upwelled, fracturing the crust into fault-bounded mountain ranges and valleys, known as Horst and Graben, as well as creating volcanoes and volcanic edifices. Faults denote where exactly the crust has been fractured in the basin and range, and the province is home to several hundred active faults capable of generating strong earthquakes. The aforementioned upwelling magma due to the rifting of North America in the basin and range is the main driving force of the tectonism of the area, and thus of the Wasatch Fault. The Wasatch Fault is especially active due to it being on the eastern edge of the geologic province. This is because much of the energy associated with basin and range crustal extension is transferred to both edges of the province, as stable blocks of crust bound both sides of the basin and range. Larger, stable blocks of crust accommodate more tectonic strain, because they have more mass than smaller, unstable blocks of crust do. This is exactly what happens at the foot of the Sierra Nevada in the west, and at the foot of the Wasatch Range in the east, hence why both margins of the basin and range are so seismically active. While the western basin and range is more seismically active than the eastern edge of the province is, the Wasatch Front experiences its fair share of seismicity. Within the last 6,500 years, the Wasatch Fault has experienced at least 26 surface rupturing earthquakes of magnitude 6.5 or greater, the last one occurring roughly 500 years ago near Nephi. Earthquakes of this strength occur every 300 to 400 years on average in the region. Because the last major earthquake to hit the Wasatch Fault occurred roughly 500 years ago, and the average recurrence rate of large, surface rupturing earthquakes on the fault is 300 to 400 years, one could surmise that the quote-unquote big one is overdue. Of course, it's more complicated than that, as averages are just averages, but the probability of a highly damaging earthquake in the region in the near future is alarming. Seismologists have indicated that there is a 43% chance of a magnitude 6.8 or stronger earthquake to strike the Wasatch Front within the next 50 years. The likelihood of an earthquake of magnitude 6.0 or greater to strike the region within the same time frame is 57%, according to the same study. 
The Wasatch Fault itself has an 18% chance of producing the big one in this time frame, but several other faults pose serious threat to the Wasatch Front, including the Ochre Great Salt Lake Fault Zone, factoring into that 43% chance of a 6.8 and 57% chance of a 6.0 within the next 50 years. Another complicating factor into calculating the probability of a large earthquake hitting the area is the fact that the Wasatch Fault is split into several different segments that each have their own unique recurrence intervals of major earthquakes. There are 10 segments in the Wasatch Fault, and from a geological standpoint, I would personally be wary of the Brigham City segment, as the last magnitude 6.5 plus earthquake to hit that segment occurred roughly 2,500 years ago, despite having an average recurrence rate of about 1,000 years. Regardless, averages are just averages, and we can only do so much to prepare for disasters. The most recent significant earthquake to hit the Wasatch Fault was actually not that long ago. On March 18th, 2020, a magnitude 5.7 earthquake struck Magna, just west of Salt Lake City. This earthquake was strongly felt throughout Salt Lake City and surrounding areas, and originated on the Wasatch Fault at a depth of 6.6 .6 miles, or 10.6 kilometers, below the surface of the Earth. The exact point in the Earth where this earthquake struck is known in seismology as the hypocenter, or focus, while the geographic location immediately above the hypocenter is known as the epicenter, which is a more famous term. There were no casualties, but several injuries were reported, as were over 2,800 aftershocks. Minor damage was reported throughout the Wasatch Front, including roughly $629 million worth of damages. Coincidentally enough, the Salt Lake Temple in downtown Salt Lake City was undergoing seismic retrofitting when the earthquake struck, and during the earthquake, the Angel Moroni statue on top of the highest spire on the temple was damaged, as it lost its iconic trumpet. Other historical buildings were damaged as well, including the Rio Grande Depot and St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral. Most of the damage was confined to the communities of West Valley City and Magna, the two closest locations to the earthquake's epicenter. Cypress High School and Westlake Junior High were quite damaged, and interestingly enough, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many injuries were avoided because students were not attending in-person classes. Lastly, 8,200 gallons of hydrochloric acid leaked from a tank at the Kennecott Utah Coppers refinery, but luckily, this was confined to the facility. While this was a significant earthquake, it was far from the big one. The 2020 Salt Lake City earthquake was considered moderate. The quote-unquote big one would likely be at least 100 times more powerful than this earthquake was. The 2020 quake was a magnitude 5.7, and seismologists estimate that an earthquake as strong as magnitude 7.2 is likely to hit the region in the near future. Because the scale in which earthquakes are measured, the moment magnitude scale, is logarithmic, a magnitude 7.2 earthquake is roughly 178 times more powerful than a magnitude 5.7 is. If an earthquake of this magnitude were to hit the Wasatch Front, the results would be nothing short of disastrous. While no data is currently available in the event of a magnitude 7.2 earthquake in particular, the USGS has outlined what could occur if a 7.0 hit the fault. In the event of a magnitude 7.0 earthquake striking the Wasatch Fault with an epicenter near Salt Lake City, the USGS estimates 2,000 to 2,500 casualties, 7,400 to 9,300 serious injuries, 84,000 plus families displaced from their homes, and over $33 billion in immediate short-term damages. Water, electric, gas, and sewer lines would likely be severed for up to a few months, leaving residents on their own to live off the grid until aid arrives. Liquefaction would also be a huge danger in the immediate aftermath of this earthquake, as the lion's share of the Salt Lake Valley is composed of loosely consolidated sediments with a very shallow water table. Basically, much of the Salt Lake Valley is filled with waterlogged dirt. 
Liquefaction is defined as the phenomenon where water-saturated soil loses its strength and stiffness during an earthquake, effectively turning into quicksand. This is highly dangerous, as ground that has been liquefied can critically damage buildings and structures, putting people at grave risk of injury or death. Keep in mind that this scenario outlines what could happen in the event of a magnitude 7.0 earthquake hitting the Wasatch Fault. An earthquake as strong as magnitude 7.2 is considered likely to strike the region, and a 7.2 is 1.58 times stronger than a 7.0 is, so take that as you will when thinking about how a 7.0 could ravage the Wasatch Front. The absolute maximum earthquake that could theoretically strike the fault, according to seismologists, would be a magnitude 7.5 earthquake, which is 5.6 times stronger than a magnitude 7.0 is. The USGS has not yet put together a scenario for a magnitude 7.5 earthquake striking the Wasatch Fault, but given the statistics we just went over regarding a 7.0, a 7.5 could possibly lead to tens of thousands of casualties and injuries, with over 100,000 families displaced from their homes. With all of this said, please take this with a grain of salt, as this is all just conjecture on my part. I'm not a disaster expert, I'm just a geologist with a YouTube channel. For more information regarding what could happen in the event of a magnitude 7.0 earthquake striking the area, I recommend reading this report from the USGS. I'll link the paper in the description of the video. While the numbers from this magnitude 7.0 scenario may sound mind-boggling, they're actually a lot lower than they could be. What I mean by that is this. Utah, and especially the Wasatch Front in particular, has strict seismic codes that its buildings are built to. This means that your house, place of work, or wherever was specially designed and built to not collapse in the event of a powerful earthquake. Seismic code was enacted in Utah's construction standards in 1968 and began being widely enforced in 1970. This means that if your house was built after 1970, and most of them in the Wasatch Front are, it probably won't collapse in the event of a large earthquake. The most dangerous buildings in the area are unreinforced masonry buildings that predate this seismic code, and even then, there have been widespread campaigns to seismically retrofit older buildings so that they do withstand strong earthquakes. Let's put this into perspective. In countries like Haiti, where there is no seismic code, loss of life due to an earthquake is far higher than what would occur in Utah. Back in 2010, a magnitude 7.0 earthquake struck Port-au-Prince, Haiti, an earthquake of comparable magnitude to what will likely strike Salt Lake City. Moreover, the Haiti earthquake struck at a shallow depth of 8.1 miles, quite similar to the depth at which a Wasatch Fault earthquake would likely occur. The population of Port-au-Prince is just over 3 million, comparable to the Wasatch Front's 2.8 million. With all of these geographic similarities considered, there's one key difference between Port-au-Prince and the Wasatch Front. The Wasatch Front builds their buildings to seismic code. Over 160,000 people died in the 2010 Haiti earthquake, mainly because of buildings crushing them due to a lack of seismic building code. Take solace in the fact that we live in a country where seismic engineering is a thing. While it will be bad when the big one hits Utah, it could be a lot worse. I know some people may not vibe with this perspective, but let's be real here, it's just reality. Another reality is that Haiti lacks seismic code due to political and economic reasons, but that's a subject beyond the scope of this video. Being prepared is key to surviving a strong earthquake, especially in a seismically active region like the Wasatch Front. To learn more about what to do to plan for and survive an earthquake, click on this video. This video also dives deep into the fault lines of the San Francisco Bay Area, so if you want to just learn how to survive an earthquake, go ahead and skip to 1735 in the video. I won't take it personally. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing to my channel, as it really helps me to get more content like this out to y'all. Thanks again, and as always, peace!
Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. If you enjoy content like this, please like the video and subscribe to the channel, and check out some of our other adventures right here. As always guys, thanks again and peace!